Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's theCUBE, covering EMC World 2015. Brought to you by EMC, Brocade, and VCE. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are live here in Las Vegas for theCUBE at EMC World 2015. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconANGLE. I'm joined with two special guests, Stella Lowe, who's the global communications at EMC, runs global communications, and Amy Posey, neuro facilitator at Peak Teams. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Thank you, good to so see you again, John. you had a session, Women of the World. We did it last year, but a great CUBE session last year. Um, so I want to, Ask a couple quick questions. What's going on with Women of the World? When you guys just came from there, you guys were on a panel. And then what is a neuro facilitator? <laughs> and then let's get into it. Let's talk about men and women, how we work together. Okay, great. So let's start with Women of World. So, um, so last year we talked about the challenges that we face and how we reframe them into opportunities and we had some fantastic panelists. But this year I was really interested in the science behind men and women. So you know, it's clear that we're different and we're all wired for success. But, but we're wired differently, and we kind of knew that already. I know we've talked about it before, John. <laughs> but we now have the science behind it. We can look at brain scans, and we can see that we, are, we have different brain patterns, we think differently, uh, different parts of the brain fire, fire up in, in times of motivation and stress. And people like Amy here, who've done lots of work into this, have ha have all this data. So it was great to have her on the panel to discuss it. So I, I, I got to give you a plug because EMC does all kinds of things with like Formula One cars, motorcycles, getting the data, and understanding the race. But now you're doing with people. So what is going on? Tell us what's a neuro facilitator, <laughs> and let's. T share with us. So a neuro facilitator is maybe the best made up job title in the world that I gave myself. So essentially what I do is I look at information about the brain and I curate the research that's out there. So there's a lot of new technology to actually read and look inside our heads. We all have a brain, but we don't necessarily all know how it works. So there's a lot more research and, and tools to read our brains and take a look inside. So what I do is I take that research and, and work with um, neuroscientists and neurobiologists at Stanford, Columbia, UCLA, and, and reach out and figure out how do we take that information and make it easier, facilitate. And I do it in the scope of leadership at organizations like EMC and other technology companies to figure out how do we work better? What information is out there? You know, soft skills and sort of relationship skills have always been sort of squishy, right? So now there's a lot more science and information about our brains that are informing it. The, the data's out there. What I do and what my job is is to pull the data and figure out how do we make it into practical, useful applications for us at work, at home, wherever we are. So that's essentially what I'm doing. So you guys discussed how men and women are different. Mm -hmm. Actually look at the data. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of qualitative data. <laughs> I mean, keeps counselors in business, you know, families in yeah, okay. and, and the <laughs> yeah. workforce. Uh, balance is important, but we have a lot of that data. But what's the numbers? What's your findings? So what's interesting is looking at men and women's brains, what, what's fascinating is that we, we are more alike than than dissimilar in looking at a brain. If you looked at a brain scan, one of a, a man and woman, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the two. But they're now finding and looking at different parts of the brain and different functions. So for instance, men have approximately 6% more gray matter than women. So in terms of the gray matter, that's the, the thinking brain essentially. And women have more white matter than gray matter, about 9% more than men. And the white matter is what connects the, the brain and communicates both front and back and side to side. And so you can make some extrapolation of that information and say, you know, men may focus more on issues, solutions, problems, whereas women sort of think more broadly or, or wider. So, I mean, they're generalities, but a lot of this science is, is fascinating. There's also some interesting science about the hippocampus, which is um, sort of deep, if this is your brain, it's deep inside the brain. Uh, and the hippocampus is the memory center, and it's, what they're finding is that for women, they tend to store emotional memories more effectively. So happy, sad, fearful, those types of emotions get stored more effectively in the hippocampus. Whereas men, oftentimes, um, during stress, the hippocampus actually has a, a challenge in making connections. So that's where, again, some of the, the focus and determination and, and silo views sometimes that men have in situations or problems comes into play. Um, there's one other piece, the anterior cingulate cortex, which is sort of within the brain, and that's the brain's error detector. And it turns out it's a little bit bigger in women. So women sort of tend to look for uh, issues, you know, problems, um, 
maybe less solution focused, especially under times of stress. And and a lot of this data is interesting. It, it, it causes you to make some generalities. You know, not everybody is going to operate in that way. Your mileage may vary, but it's it's good because it helps us inform some of the quirky behavior that we deal with at work and figuring out why why do you do that? Why do yeah. you do that? And it's not about women being better or women using more of the brain or less of the brain. It's 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 simply about we we if our brains are working differently, we both bring different things to the table. And how, how do you take both of those benefits and, and bring them forward into better outcomes? I mean, this is always great to talk about because in the workforce, people are different. And so differences is a term that we use. Like, you know, with kids, some learn differently, some evolve differently, and men and women have, have differences. So the data shows that, that's clear. Um, I want to share a quote that my wife shared on Facebook. It says, "Mother, um, well, a worried mother does better research than the FBI. <laughs> right? So um, I bring that up because you know it's instinctful. So a lot of it's uh, also biological mm -hmm. and also environmental. Talk about the dynamics around that that wiring because you're wired by your upbringing too. That affects yeah. you. Yes. And but what's the what's the data show in the the, the biology? So it's interesting because the, the key piece is that it's not just the biological brain differences, it's it's a whole host of factors that leave a footprint on us and our behavior. So it's our education, it's our, uh, you know, where we, where we grew up, our culture is part of that. It's also gender stereotypes that play a role in how we operate. And, and I think all of those things leave a footprint on, a, on and lead us to different behaviors. And so you can't just say it's the, the, the information that's on our brains. It's a whole host of factors that influence. So my study in looking at how the brains are a little bit different and what the research is coming, it's, it's blended in with research around leadership and things like confidence and motivation in the workplace, bias in the workplace, and they're, they're showing very different things. So for instance, if you think about confidence, we did a, an interesting exercise in the event at Women of World, and I asked, you know, there's, there's a lot about confidence, and confidence is essentially the, the will or motivation to act. So how many women in the room uh, would raise the, you know, go up for a job that they were really interested in and fascinated by, but maybe weren't 100% qualified for? Like how many of you have maybe turned down that job or, or decided not to apply because it wasn't the right time. Like you, you're pretty competent, but not 100% confident in it. And it was funny because large the majority. Hands. Yeah. All the women's hands went up that I could Way see. in the room. Yeah. So then I asked and I flipped the question in the room and I asked the men in the room. I said, okay, if you were only about 50% confident for a job that you were going up oh, for, yeah. would you, of course, yeah, right? They, like, yes, yeah, I'm up they'll for it. Fabricate some stuff on their resume. You make them look bigger. So exactly. You so know? what's interesting is testosterone plays a role in confidence and motivation at work. And it turns out men have 10 times the amount of testosterone as women do. So part of that is that aggression, we both have it, but the, that aggressive factor, that idea to, to go after something, to be more confident, um, women are behind the curve in that from the, the research that I've seen. So it takes more effort to, to, to be able to have the confidence to go for it and, and to sort of break down those barriers that exist for women to, to go after those jobs that they want, even if it's not 100%. And so we did a, a, an exercise um, in boosting confidence and testosterone called power posing. And Amy Cuddy out of Harvard does a, a whole a TED talk on it, which is fascinating. But the idea is that you, you, know, you, you put your chest back, you put your hands on your hips, and, and it helps boost your testosterone up to about 20%. And it reduces cortisol, which wow. is a stress hormone. So it's a, it's a quick way. You don't do it in front of people. <laughs> you do it sort of on the sly, or else you kind of, yeah. you don't look very nice to others. But you, you boost your confidence by doing that. And it's just a small sort of brain hack that, that you can do to, to give yourself an upper hand knowing that knowing the science behind it. So it's a behavior changing type of uh, research that's coming out, which I think is really good. That's really interesting. But now it translates to uh, leadership and execution in the workforce. So people are different, but men and women are different. That changes this, the dynamic around what good is. Because if your point about women not asking for that job or having confidence to I feel like I'm not going to go for it, like a yeah. man, bravado, whatever, testosterone, that doesn't mean that that's the benchmark of what drive means. So it, it, and this came up with Microsoft's CEO at the Anita Board Conference, which we had a, a um, cube there, and, and this is a big issue. So how do HR, how do the managers, how do people recognize the differences and what does the data show, and, and can you share your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I think a lot of it comes down to bias. And bias is essentially a shortcut that we use in our brains to take less energy 
And it's, it's not a bad thing. It's, it's something we all do. And it's conscious and it's unconscious. So bias, I think, is a, a key piece of that. And, and the research on bias is fascinating. It's very, it's, it's very popular topic these days. Because I think being able to do a couple of things, be aware that there are hundreds of biases and they're both conscious and unconscious, uh, acknowledge that it exists, but not legitimize it, not make that okay. The third piece is to, to counter it. And, and being able to counter bias by making sure that people have opportunities. And even though you may have re removed hypothetical barriers, explicitly stating that you want people, men or women, to apply for promotions, be this type of leader. Not just assume that because there are no barriers that it's okay, but really be explicit in how you give people opportunities and let them know that they're out there. And I think that's really key. You know, that brings up the point around work-life balance because you know I have a family of four, four kids, it's stressful just in and of itself to have four kids, but then I go to the workforce and the same with women too. So there's also a home dynamic uh, with leadership and biases and roles. Um, what's your take on any data on uh, how that shifting persona, realities if you will, uh, shapes the data? So it's interesting because it's it's something that we even talked about in the session that yeah. it's a struggle. And and um, Bev Crear from Intel was talking about that there's a, a period of time that actually is really tough to keep women in the workforce. And it's that time where you're growing your family, you're growing your career, and oftentimes things sort of struggle. And I, I read something recently around women in STEM careers over a 10 year period 42% of women drop out of the workforce in comparison to 17% of men. And so I think there's a lot, a, a, a ways to go in terms of being able to set up environments where work and life is integrated because it's not, it's not even balance anymore, it's integration. And how do you set up structures so that people can do that through how they work, through how they connect with others. And, and to me, that's a big piece is how do you keep people in the workforce and still contributing in that critical point in time. And you know, Intel hasn't figured it out. Yeah. It's a tough challenge. Well, so of STEM, and we're a big fans of women in tech, obviously, because we love tech athletes, we love to promote people who are rock stars in technology, whether it's developers, the leaders, and I also have a da two daughters. And yeah. so, two questions. One is, women in tech, anything you can share that the data can talk to, to either inspire, or give some insight, and two, for the young women out there, that might not have that cultural baggage that my generation is at least or worse, <laughs> older than me, have from a previous bias. So motivating young daughters out there, and then how you deal with the, the career uh, advice for existing women. So the, the motivating young women to get into tech, um, Bev shared a really absolutely fascinating statistic that between the ages of 12 and 18, it's incredibly important to have a male support model for young girls to get into STEM careers, that it was absolutely critical for their success. And it's funny because the question came up like, why can't that be a woman too? And what's interesting and, and what we find is, oftentimes we, we give men the short shrift when they try and support women, and we don't want to do that. We want to support men supporting women because when that happens, we all win. Yep. Um, and so I think that's a, a big piece of it, is starting young and starting with male support as well as female support. Yeah, and I know so many women who, who cite men as, as huge yeah. mentors in their career, you know, or in their early life, and it's really important that men feel that they can do that. And this goes back down to the wiring data that you have, the yes. data on how we're wired. It's okay, guys, to understand that it's not an apples to apples, so to speak, men are from Mars, women are from Venus, whatever that phrase and, is, yeah. but that's really what the data and, shows. Yeah. And being explicit to men to say, we want you to support yeah. women, instead of having men take a back seat, feeling like maybe this isn't my battle mm -hmm. to fight, it's it's really important to then encourage men to speak up too in those those situations. To, to think about sort of women in tech, one of a, a really interesting piece of research that I've seen is about team intelligence and what happens on teams. And Anita Woolley from Carnegie Mellon produces really fascinating fascinating piece of research on the three things that a team needs to be more intelligent. It's not just getting the smartest people in the room with the highest IQ, that's a part of it. You yep. want table stakes, you want to start with smart people. But she found that having women, more women on a team, actually improved the team's overall intelligence, the collective intelligence and success of a team. So more women was the first one. The second was there's this ability, and women tend to be better at it, but the ability to read someone's thoughts and emotions just by looking at their eyes. So it's called reading in the mind's eye. So just taking a look and being able to sense behavior <laughs> um, and, and what someone's thinking and feeling, and then being able to adjust behavior to that and yeah. pivot on that. Not yeah. just focusing on the task at hand, but the 
cohesion of a team with that skill made a difference. It's and like, it's it's a total team sport now. Yes. That's what you're saying. Yes. In terms of, I use sport analogy, but <laughs> yeah. but, but women now, you see women's sports is booming. This brings up my, my your uh, awesome research that you just did for the folks out there. Uh, Stella was leading this information generation yeah. study. Mm -hmm. And the diversity of use cases now with tech, which is why we love tech so much, is not just the geeky programmer traditional male role, you mentioned team, you got UX design, you have um, real time, agile, so you have more of a, whether it's a rowing analogy or whatever sport or music. Collaboration. And collaboration yeah. is key and there's so many new disciplines. I mean, I'll share data that I have on theCUBE looking at all the six years and interviewing women and men, the pattern that's coming up is women love the visualization. It's weird, I don't know if that's just so it's in the data, but like data scientists that render into reporting and visualization, mm -hmm. not like just making slides, like in the data. Yeah. yeah. So, but they're not writing maybe not Python code. So yeah. what do you guys see similar patterns in terms of uh, information generation? It's sexy to have an eye watch. It's it is. cool. So, so Bev uh, Crayer from Intel on the panel, she gave a, a great statistic that actually uh, it's more, it's women that are more likely to make a decision on consumer tech than men. Uh, and yet, a lot of the focus is about trying to build tech for men. Uh, and then, you know, if, if consumer tech companies want to get this right, they need to start thinking about what, what are women looking for, uh, because uh, they're the ones that are out there making those decisions, the majority of those yeah. decisions. Yeah, I mean, it's an old saying back in the day when I was in co um, right out of college and doing my first startup, was the wife test. Yeah. And everything goes by the wife because you yeah. want to have collaborative decision making. And that's kind of been seen as a negative bias or reinforcement bias. But I think what guys mean is like they want to get their partner involved. Yeah. So how do you, how do we change the biases? And you know, where I talked to a guy who said the word geek is you know reinforcing a bias or nerd. We're like, I use that term <laughs> all the time um, with science. Is there, I mean, we had the, the lawsuit with Kleiner Perkins around the gender discrimination. She wasn't included. I mean. What's your take on all this? I mean, how does someone practically take the data and put it, in the, put it into practice? I, I think the big thing is, you know, like I said, acknowledging that it exists, right? It's out exactly. there. We've been, I, I feel like our brains haven't necessarily adapted to the modern workplace yep. and the challenges that we've dealt with because the modern workplace is something that was invented in the 1960s and our brains have evolved over a long time. So being able to handle some of the challenges that we have, especially on how men and women operate differently at the workplace, I think is key. But calling it out and making it okay to, to acknowledge it, but then counter where it needs to be countered, where it's not right, and being explicit. And having the conversations, I think is the big piece. And and that's what struck me with the, the Kleiner Perkins deal was, let's have the conversation, it's out there. Yeah. A lot of times people are reticent to, to have the conversation yeah. because yeah. it's awkward and I need to be PC and I'm worried about things. It's the elephant in the room, right? It, it, it yeah. actually is. But dialogue is far better than leaving it. People are place. afraid, I mean, guys yeah. are afraid, women are afraid, so it's a negative cycle if it's not an out in the open. That's and, what you're saying. And the idea is, it's what can we do collectively better to, to be more positive, to, to frame it more positively? Because I think that makes a, a bigger difference in, ter in terms of talking about oh, we're different, how are we the same? How can we work together? What is the, the connection point that you bring, you bring? We all bring different skills and talents to the table. I think it's really taking a look at that and talking about it and calling it out and say, I'm not great at this, you're great at this, let's let's work together on what we can do uh, more effectively. Okay, team sports is great, and the diversity of workforce and tech is an issue, that's awesome. So I'd ask you kind of a different question for both of you guys. What's the biggest surprise in the data and it could be re what reinforce the belief or insight into something new, share uh, a surprise. Um, it could be pleasant or you know, <laughs> creepy or <laughs> what, so share think, it. What? So I think a surprise for me is intuition. So we always talk about women having intuition and I've heard men say, you know, oh, my wife is so intuitive, she kind of she, she kind of gets it. And I've heard that in the workplace as well. And I think the biggest surprise for me was that we can now see, we've now proved that intuition, intuition is a thing that women have. And it's about this kind of web thinking and connecting the dots. Yeah. So we sort of store these memories deep, deep inside. And then when we see something similar, uh, we then make that connection. We call it intuition, but it's actually some, it's a kind of, uh, you know, super recall, if you like, and, and, and replaying that situation. That, that I think was the biggest surprise for me. Amy? So I, I would think that the thing that, that always astonishes me is the workplace environment and how we set up environments sometimes to shoot ourselves in the foot. So so often we'll set up a, a competitive environment, whatever it is. Let's, let's 
and it's internal competition. Well, it turns out that the way that the brain chemicals work in women is that competition actually throws us into to, to stress or threat cycle much more easily than it does to men, but men need it to be able to get to optimal arousal. There's a lot of interesting research from Amy Arniston at Yale, and, and that piece of how you can manipulate your environment to be more successful together, to me, is absolutely key. And being able to pull out elements of competition, but also elements of collaboration. You kind of knew it, but the science validates it, and you go, this is why we need to make sure there's a balance between the two so everyone's successful. So to me, that's the, the aha. I, I could listen to Amy all day talking Absolutely. about this stuff and, and, how, and how we apply it to the workplace, that's the next big step. Yeah, you guys are awesome and thanks so much for sharing and I wish we could go long, we're getting the hook here on time, but is there any links and locations, websites we can people can go to to get more information on the studies, the science? So I spend a lot of my day curating and looking for more research, so peakteams.com slash blog is where I do a lot of my writing and suggestions. What's um, the URL? It's peakteams, P-E-A-K-T-E-A-M-S dot com. Mm -hmm. And so I run our blog and kind of put my musings every once in a while up there so that people can see what I'm working on, um, but they can reach out at any time. And I'm on Twitter at, at Peak Teams Geek. Speaking of geeks, I embrace the geek mentality. Good. So well, we have, I think geeks compliment personally, but um, final point, I'll give you the last word, Amy. If you could have a magic wand to take the science and change the preferred vision of the future, with respect to men and women, you know, working cohesively together, understanding that we're different, decoupled in science now, what would you want to see for the environment, workforce, life balance? What would be the magic wand that you would change? I, I think being able to make women more confident by helping reduce bias with everybody. So being more uh, keyed in to those biases that we have and those automatic things we do to shortcut and to be more aware of them and work on them together and not see them as bad, but see them as human. So I think yeah. that's my big takeaway right. is remove, remove more bias. That's Love fantastic. That. Stella Lowe and Amy Posey here inside theCUBE. Thanks so much. Congratulations on all your great work. Great panel will continue. Thank of you. course, we have a special channel on SiliconAngle.tv for women in tech. Go to SiliconAngle.tv. We got a lot of CUBE alumni. We had another one here today with Amy. Thank you for joining us. This is theCUBE, we'll be right back. Day three, bringing it to a close here inside theCUBE, live in Las Vegas. I'm John Furrier, we'll be right back after this short break.